Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre, with your host, Lonnie Scott. Okay, this is Weird Web Radio, trying to be serious. No. <laughs> We're off to a great start. Morgan Daimler, <laughs> welcome back to Weird Web Radio. It's so great to have you here. It is great to be here. I'm, I'm very excited yeah, to be if back. All of you, if all of you could have only heard the random things <laughs> that just came out of our mouth the last 20 minutes. <laughs> it was a very My apologies. Deep, I didn't record it. <laughs> a very deep philosophical <laughs> occult discussion that... about toilets. About and toilets. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> that summarizes just skip it skip right to the end yeah <laughs> so <laughs> now that i've got everybody loosened up a little bit let's talk about the really um complicated matters i tried to figure out like what should i start this conversation with because i've already asked you a lot of the annoying questions when i had you on the show last that mm -hmm. i wanted to know about and i thought what would everyone want to know about this time <laughs> um so I went to your book, Living Fairy, the one that just came out recently. Yep, uh, Excellent book. Highly recommend it. Uh, in the conclusion of all places, you make a statement in the book that says, we have forgotten where witchcraft came from and where its power is rooted. That's quite a statement. It is. Let's discuss. Because I, I try <laughs> never to be controversial or to say anything that could no. upset people. Clearly. Right. That's how I live my life. Yes. It's the best way to go. <laughs> Um, right. Yeah, no, it's and it's something that I, I really strongly believe. Um, I I think that there's multiple reasons this has all happened. So I'm trying to, to think of exactly where to start explaining this. But um, as we talked in about the book, in the, you start by pointing at the 50s. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> that's a good place yeah. to start blaming a lot of things on. Um, uh -huh. Well, and as I had said in the, the last show of yours that I was on. Um, we were talking about how, you know, respectively got into witchcraft. And I had mentioned that I was um, fairly young. It was the early 90s and doing it since. And, you know, having been in sort of the wider witchcraft community for, um, you know, basically 30 years at this point, you, you kind of see certain trends. And when I first got into it, there was definitely sort of this push to make witchcraft more palatable. Um, it was kind of the beginning of this good PR, um, you know, witches are positive forces of healing and change mm -hmm. sort of a thing, uh, which was in contrast to what we'd seen a little bit earlier. Although, as you mentioned, in the 50s, when we first start seeing witchcraft come out publicly, there was also this kind of push for this, you know, witchcraft is good, witchcraft is light, witchcraft is wonderful, you know. Witches. And witchcraft was naked. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, yeah, definitely. They, that's that's that why I said, thing. like. <laughs> yeah. When, when we get into the 70s. Still a thing for some. <laughs> it, it is. Um, when we get into the 70s, we definitely see it shifting a little bit um, sideways into that, you know nudity and freedom and sort of embrace your your true self kind of energy um and then you know the 80s happened which for those of us who lived through it you'll remember was a terrible time and you know very very <laughs> against everything that had happened in the 60s and 70s and very corporate and work as hard as you can and you know woohoo yuppies 1980s um so when we hit yeah, the 90s yeah, with yeah. witchcraft, Fuck Russia. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, that pretty much was everything Those... from the 50s forward. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. commie bastards. I heard that a lot in my house when I was a child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up in a military family. So, yeah. Yikes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but when we hit the 90s, we, we start to see this, you know, push to make witchcraft family friendly, I guess is the best way to explain it. 
we see movies coming out like Practical Magic and The Craft. We see the original Charmed come out on TV. This is the later 90s. But it's just this sort of idea that witchcraft is very much about personal empowerment, but in a way that's very helpful and positive and you know, who wouldn't want to have a witch as a neighbor because they're just super awesome. (laughs) And we've kind of continued with that into the 21st century um, to the point where witchcraft, um, specifically like public mainstream U.S. witchcraft, is very much about acceptability politics, in my opinion. Um, Just again not what do you mean by acceptability politics the idea that you want to be just like everyone else you want to be Mm. um completely acceptable to everyone around you um pta soccer mom you know no one would ever think you aren't exactly like your church going neighbors because you fit right in um just you know everyone should like you Um, And it's that sort of model minority, but with witchcraft, you know, you want to be that, that person. And in the process of doing all this, um, we've really lost touch with what witchcraft has always been and what it's often been used for and sort of the, the core of it. Um, And I'm not criticizing people who, you know, it's really important to them to have all the stuff I just mentioned, Um, I'm not trying to anyway, but it gets to a point where if you're not like that, there's a lot of pressure to be like that, to not make witchcraft Mm. look bad, you know, which do you think that pressure is still out there? Oh, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely do. Um, I think it's a little different now, um, than it was. Uh, about 10 years ago, it was definitely still a strong thing. Um, I, as we've established, have been part of witchcraft for a while, but I've also been part of the goth subculture um, for almost as long as I've been a witch. And um, I've gotten a lot of pressure over the years, particularly the last um, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, Not so much in the 90s, but after that not to do that because it makes other witches look bad. It it makes it look like it's a costume and that witchcraft is just this spooky thing. Um, despite the fact that those two things being a witch and, and being into the goth subculture are separate things. You know, my religion's my religion, my spiritual practice is my spiritual practice. And then my aesthetic is, is something completely different. It's like saying you can't be a witch and be into like country Western music because cowboy hats and and cowboy boots make witches look bad i mean it's that same kind of logic but you know when it's goth then people feel more justified because it's spooky and plays into the stereotype and this is all stuff i've been told for a long time and now the last five years or so as that kind of aesthetic has caught on particularly with younger people I was just going to say not to make myself sound old, but I think I've already made myself sound old repeatedly. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's too late. It's We're middle age. It's, it's way too late. <laughs> um, but particularly the people who are, you know, in their teens or early 20s who kind of embrace this, this aesthetic witchcraft is what they're calling it. Um, mm-hmm. Then that becomes a thing people push back against. The aesthetic witches, basic witches, um, and this idea that it, it shouldn't be like a costume it's all those layers of judgment and this idea that you can look at someone and know based on how they dress or that sort of thing, whether they're serious doing little air quotes, serious practitioner or not. And, Mm. you know, this all to me is layered into this acceptability politics thing, this idea that we have to be taken seriously and we want people to see us as a legitimate religion and, all this other stuff. And, you know, the, the truth is when you look at what witchcraft is, it's always been a tool of the disempowered. It's always been a tool of people who are socially powerless. Um, you know, it was not something that was done by like the elite for the most part, or, um, you know, people who had 
money and social power and influence because they didn't need to do it. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't I need think about to do that it. a lot. Yeah, I yeah. think about that a lot, especially when we look at history and the mm -hmm. things that survive through lore and, you know, what people call lore and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and the things that get written down are, especially like in the world of heathenry, are the things that were probably used to entertain whoever was in charge at the time they wrote it down. Mm -hmm. More so than a reflection of your common everyday magical practitioner's thoughts on the world around them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've often yeah. said that like the sagas and, and those sorts of stories are basically the soap operas of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> oh, it's good sure. quality entertainment. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely agreed. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Um, the witch aesthetic is a thing uh, mm -hmm. that I haven't delved into it a whole lot. But like when I hear that, I think Instagram. Like, have, how have they set up the perfect deeper shade color brown kind of yep. altar photos with, the, you know, the right things yep. that look what they, and I'll give them credit, they do create really cool looking pictures. Do you see harm in that as a gateway into witchcraft? Or even if that's all it really is for someone? Oh, this is going to be like the interview where I'm just going to say all the controversial stuff and then everyone's going to hate me forever. Um yeah. I, I actually do to, not. We invoked <laughs> the toilet before we started. <laughs> we did, we did. That's what started it all. Um, I actually uh -huh. do not. I, I think that aesthetic witchcraft, basic witchcraft, Instagram witchcraft, TikTok witchcraft, there are certain aspects of it that we should have discussions about, um, particularly sort of the, the lack of nuance and the, the shallowness that can be sort of attached to it. But I don't, think any of that is a bad thing or a bad way um to help people get into actual belief and practice you're always going to have people who are just curious about it dabble in it a bit and then you know move on to something else but there are going to be people who this is what gets them into it you know i i can have an entire show with you where we could discuss the the marvel thor movies or the new loki show and how that is or is not connected to norse mythology but those shows can be a good way to help people get into heathenry they're gonna have to unlearn a lot <laughs> you know once they get there <laughs> yeah. but but that doesn't mean it's a bad way to get the idea and the concept out there to people who maybe um, were really unfamiliar with it. Um, you know, everyone has to start somewhere. Not everyone's going to start with the, you know, the Icelandic sagas or, uh, you know, ye old super serious book of witchcraft. Yeah. Well, in, in all fairness to the people who enter heathenry through Thor movies or now the Loki show, if they feel inspired to pursue those more, Really, no more uh, less valid fictional launch, I guess, into heathenry than the Hammer Rite or <laughs> <laughs> or I love some that you other went there. <laughs> crazy shit that came out of the seventies. That hey, if you do it and it works for you, I'm super stoked because at heart I'm a chaos magician before I'm anything else. Yep, and yep. if it works, it works. But don't get on your high horse and judge someone where they got started and inspired when a large chunk of what was once considered real heathenry is total and utter bullshit as far as its concerns are linked to the past. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 No, so. everybody has to start somewhere. And, you know, like you said, there's a lot of stuff out there that is extremely <laughs> historically questionable, but right. it works. And, you know, That's right. <laughs> we can also get into a whole really interesting debate, which I think applies to heathenry and witchcraft both, that how long does something have to be out there and, and be used consecutively and work for people before we're willing to admit that even if it wasn't done a thousand years ago, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I'm not also defending valid. the hammer right, by the way. <laughs> Also valid. You got 50 years of people doing the hammer right or so. Yeah. <laughs> Consecrating space as heathens. And it works for them. Yeah. So 
while it may not be historically valid, and I'll argue that all day long, <laughs> it, it is is certainly valid to the living tradition of what it is now. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I I watch your Thor movies and come join in. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, like I like to tell people, come to the North Side. We have Thor. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good over here. Um, it's good over here. Yeah. You know, a lot of people will will really hate on Wicca a lot. I'm not Wiccan to be clear, but I've never understood that. Like people will be like, well, it's not ancient. It's not historic. Who cares? I mean, you know, realistically at this point, another 20 or 30 years, it's going to be a hundred years old. I think we have to start giving it a little more respect maybe for how long it's been around. But even if, you know, it's only been around 20 years, it's been around. People do it. It works for people. It has meaning and importance. It doesn't hurt anybody. You know, so it's also the entry point for a lot of people, especially our age in the in the 90s. I mean, I live in a small town in East Central Illinois. It yeah. in the 90s. I had Walden books in our in our local mall Walden books. and and I had a small metaphysical shop that was on the University of Illinois campus mm-hmm. about 45 miles north of me. And that was it. That was that was where I could get my material in the '90s. That meant if I wanted witchcraft, as an example, I had Scott Cunningham books to choose from, The Big Blue Book of Wicca by Uncle Bucky, yep. and uh, people are going to be offended that I include him, but the Satanic Bible, you know, like things from Anton Lavey. Um, if you're an angry kid like I was, and we kind of talked about this before, yep. joking around about some stuff, like. I read the Scott Can- Cunningham stuff and it felt comfortable and it felt safe and it felt like it, but it didn't necessarily feel a lot different than anything else that I might go do at a real progressive lovey dovey church or something. It just, instead of prayers, it had spells. It had that same feel overall to me in my mind. And it really does still today. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't compute for me. Um, LeVay was metal. <laughs> like you picked up the satanic bible as a 15 year old kid and you're like man and man and man man yep yep throw up the heavy metal yeah. sign yeah oh my god well, it, you know, my journey into all of this stuff was such a chaotic <laughs> weird fucking whatever i could get my hands on yep. in the midwest until i was 17 when i got access to books on runes and chaos magic and like that's when i found my thing yep. but until then whoo it was a hot mess well, you know <laughs> and people people hate on levee which you know it could be a whole other separate discussion mm-hmm. but you do have to respect the fact that in a lot of ways it was ground breaking and it really did open up certain things that mm-hmm. you know really before that um would would have been sort of beyond the pale you know sure to use a very dated expression um (laughs) you know and that tying back into that forgetting what witchcraft is really about and for you know again not personally a satanist but i have nothing against people who who follow that path because there are a lot of aspects of it that have to do with um sort of reclaiming your personal power and doing what you need to do you know most of the people that i know that were into satanism again um flashing back to the ye old early years um (laughs) were kids who were teenagers who just didn't have a lot of control over their lives you know and you know looking at at something like like levey's work or um witchcraft outside of the um the Wicca of the nineties, we'll say the pop Wicca, um, Cunningham and silver Ravenwolf, um, who, who did tend to have more of that acceptability angle going on with them. Um, mm-hmm. but getting into, you know, more Buckland, who was, you know, let me give you diagrams of naked people and how to properly bind them for initiation, <laughs> which was pretty edgy <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, Sybil leak, uh, Diary of a Witch, which obviously was an older text, but you know, looking at books like that, and you you kind of got this impression of like this is this is stuff I can use as someone who doesn't necessarily have a lot of control over things or influence or power to to have some control, you know. Mm-hmm. 
It's it's yeah. always been a tool of the disempowered, and I love that about it. Fair, all forms of it, even yeah. even the stuff uh, like you know, I don't want anybody thinking that we're trashing on what your what your particular way or thing is. Yeah. Because we're certainly not doing that. Uh, it's just like the history of this stuff is really interesting on how it's evolved over time from what you said from something that seemed more acceptable and I'm safe neighbors, you know, right. To now, you know, your own work includes like real in-depth research and history into folklore. Um, people like uh, Christopher Oropello and Tara McGuire, mm -hmm. they, they, their Besom's thing in store, yep. you know, that's a good book. It's really, has really transformed, I think, accessibility into a different kind of witchcraft mm -hmm. not that that witchcraft hasn't always been there but just the publication of that book made accessibility to so many people out there to have other options mm -hmm. even the modern wicca books have have taken a harder look at their history and become something i think richer and deeper as it exists today yeah definitely. So, definitely yeah it's been a fun ride but you brought up tiktok witches <laughs> i did yeah <laughs> Yeah, you went there. I did. Now, TikTok witches recently <laughs> claimed to like curse the fairies. That that is actually such an interesting thing for you to bring up. So, um, yeah. I will start this by saying, for the record, I am on TikTok because, of course, I oh, am. Same. Um, I like guitar players on TikTok. That's why yeah. I'm there, and comedians. TikTok's <laughs> a very interesting platform, <laughs> honestly. But um, that is a really good example of something that was actually a fairly minor and insignificant kind of very individual situation that some people got upset about and then the outrage over it became sort of a thing with a life of its own and really exceeded what the original like starter incident ever was to begin with um <laughs> i ended up doing a whole lot of research about this because I, I wrote an article about it and i tracked down how it all began <laughs> like like what was the video <laughs> that started all of this on tiktok I'm and curious. what was getting shared around on social media was this very unnuanced sort of you know tiktok witches are hexing the fae ah and of course then everyone is freaking out <laughs> Like, you can't do that. That's such a bad idea. Why would people do these things? You know, and then, of course, criticizing TikTok and TikTok witches. Because the, the general assumption is if you're on TikTok, you're like 15. So there was a lot of, like, a <laughs> lot of things going on, um, including right. some, you know, blatant ageism. But that aside, what actually started all of that was one woman made a video where she said that she personally was having an issue with um, what I would probably call a Lan and she, a fairy lover, but a fairy that she had had an entanglement with that she was trying to break it off. And that was not going well, which is very common actually in those sorts of situations. But this is someone who has no experience with these beings and, and didn't know that it was a bad idea to get into it to begin with and didn't realize that this is the inevitable thing that's going to happen when you try to break it off. And either way, it was just everything was going sideways. It was a huge mess. So she had said in the video she was going to ask her coven, her, her witchy friends, to help her to maybe do like a hex to get this particular fairy being out of her life, to go away, to leave her alone. And that is what actually started all of this. And then people are responding to that with, oh, this is a bad idea. You know, you don't hex hmm. the fae. And somehow the idea of don't hex the fae, meaning don't hex that one particular fairy being, got misconstrued into like you don't hex them in general, you know. And then it, it completely blew up into this, this totally other conversation um so to me that that actually was really fascinating that whole situation and yes everyone out there listening you do not hex the fae because that's a very very bad idea <laughs> it's not it's not going to end well for you um if, if hexing the fae was an option we would have a lot of stories of people successfully doing that and a lot of folklore about how to do it 
and it would be a thing embedded in folk magic across many cultures. And there's a reason that it's not. <laughs> yeah. So are you saying all the like Christian stories about chasing off the fae as demons and so on and like ringing of church bells? I know I've seen that where it's supposed to like scare them off or something. That's propaganda. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's so many layers to that question. I love it. Um, I mean, on the one hand, usually when we look at what's driving them off, it's something iron. Iron church bells, um, iron trains are another one that people will talk about driving them off. Um, things along those lines. I would definitely say, though, there's an aspect of propaganda to it. Um, for anyone who uh, hasn't read any of my ranting about this particular subject, there is quite a lot of Christian, particularly um, dominionist and propaganda um, and Protestant propaganda against the Fae um, and specifically disempowering them. And as, as you just said, Lonnie, trying to drive them out and drive them away. And part of that is this idea that it's been successful that they have been driven out, that they have been pushed away, that they've been forced out of areas. Um, and I, I'm no, no doubt to a degree there's aspects of that that are true, but it's also a fact that across hundreds of years, we see these stories of the fairies are always leaving. They're perpetually leaving, perpetually withdrawing from the world, and yet they're still here. They still remain. Mm. Um, we still have anecdotal accounts into the 21st century of people encountering these beings and interacting with them and dealing with them um, not voluntarily always because again to offend as many people as i possibly can today in this broadcast <laughs> um, not that i not that i don't give weight to people who are active believers and practitioners who have anecdotal accounts with these beings obviously i myself am one of those people but to me it's always much more profound when you have someone who doesn't really believe in this stuff who is kind of a skeptic who, you know, never really went out of their way to have these encounters who then has a profound encounter and mm -hmm. shares it because it really messes them up. Cause they're like, this is not part of my reality. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is, what is the best chance someone who's never met a fairy to meet one accidentally not on purpose <laughs> not ritually structured not building a relationship but oh fuck a fairy <laughs> <laughs> and that is the proper reaction when that happens too yeah um, <laughs> honestly your best bet is to just sort of be open to the possibility of it um i think that a lot of people a lot more people have these encounters and don't realize that's what's happening because they have a very narrow idea of what a fairy encounter would be. You know, if, if your idea is I'm going to encounter these beings and it's going to be a little sparkling ball of light, or, you know, I'm going to get a very happy feeling and a sense of peace is going to come over me. Um, or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to see this little tiny person working in my garden, whatever. Um, and these are all things I've actually heard people say. If that's your idea, if that's your preconceived notion, your odds of that ever happening are very slim. Um, not impossible, but, but very slim. Um, if you're open to the idea that these beings encompass kind of a wide range of options, shall we say, and you keep that open mind, then when you are out in the woods and you suddenly just kind of get an off feeling and then start hearing music that doesn't have a source, uh, maybe you think you see someone walking in the woods ahead of you, but you're not sure, you're more likely to say, okay, maybe this is a fairy encounter. As opposed to, well, that was kind of weird. I don't know what it was. So I'm just going to kind of not talk about it because I don't know what it was. It was just weird. Um, you know, if you're open to the idea that they can be dogs, for example. Um, I've seen fairy hounds. I've talked to other people who have also seen them. Then if you have an encounter with an animal that's inexplicable, appears from nowhere, disappears to nowhere, 
um, doesn't look quite right. Um, one of the ones I saw only had three legs, for example, not three legs like it had had four and, and lost one, but like literally it's, it's one front leg was in the center of its body, which is not a thing you normally see. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> no. It's fantastic. <laughs> it, it was something. Um, I have never run so fast. I don't think I've told you this story, so I'll tell it really quickly. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard it before. I used to be an EMT. This was in a local city. It's a smaller city because where I live, what we call cities is like 40,000 people, which I realize in some places is not even like a, a large town. Um, but it was a smaller <laughs> city and there was a construction site. And this was maybe four o'clock in the morning. And my partner and I had parked our ambulance next to the big construction site. It was all fenced in because um, we were waiting before we had to go to our next pickup. And, um, he was sitting in the ambulance reading. I got out to walk around. It was four o'clock on a February morning. What else would you do? And I was kind of walking, <laughs> kind of walking over by the fence. Um, and it's just a huge empty field, probably like two or three football fields worth in size, all fenced in with that big, like heavy construction fencing to mm -hmm. keep ne'er-do-wells out. And I start to see this white shape kind of running towards me. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. You know, clearly vaguely dog shaped. Obviously it was dark. Um, and I'm looking around. I can't see any people anywhere. There's no cars. There's no people. And it's literally running straight towards me. So I'm like, okay, this is all a little strange, but, you know, whatever. It's, you know, there's a fence between us. I'm not super afraid of dogs, so it's fine. And as it gets closer and closer, it's still running directly towards me. I realize it's, it's completely white and there's no people anywhere. There's no person in the field with it, like that had brought it there and let it out. And I start to get just a really strange feeling. You know how you can sometimes just sense like something's not right with this. Mm -hmm. And it got to where it was probably maybe 100, 150 feet away. Um, so even in the dark, I could see it fairly clearly. And that was when I realized it only had the one front leg. And it was directly in the center of its body in the front. Um, I had noticed it was running weird, like the movement wasn't right. Um, but again, in the dark, not being able to see it well as, when it was further away, I was like, okay, slow on the uptake. What do you want? Um, but as, as soon as I realized it only had the one leg and it was in the center of the body, I turned and I ran faster than I've ever run to get back in that ambulance. Because that was what I was like, this is not okay. There's no part of this that's okay. This, this is clearly not something from the human world and it's running directly at me. And I don't want to know what's going to happen oh, <laughs> when it lame. gets to me. Come on. <laughs> so I jump in the ambulance. I scare the crap out of my partner who was sitting there reading. <laughs> so he's like, you know, what, what is your problem? <laughs> and so I'm pointing out the window. I'm like, there's a dog. And we both look out. Nothing. There's absolutely nothing there. And it was not something like it's literally a wide open field and fencing. There's, there's nothing it could be hiding behind. There's nowhere it could have gone. Like in the, the three or four seconds it took me to run and jump in the door, it just was gone, completely mm. gone. So, you know, things like you that. You don't know why it appeared. You don't know. Like this was an accidental encounter. You have no idea why it was there. I don't. <laughs> I, d yeah. I chose not to ask questions in the moment because that's that's interesting yeah it was yeah. just a little too directly coming at me and yeah. my survival instincts kicked in um so accidental encounters are likely to happen i'm gathering as you have described in lonely places where you are more alone but have a degree of liminality to them and probably fog <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's not. I don't know. You didn't say anything about fog. <laughs> uh, well, liminal, liminal is an excellent <clears throat> word to apply mm -hmm. here. It's it's not restricted to any of this, but you're more likely to have encounters right around dawn or dusk or into twilight. Uh, midnight is another common time if you're wandering around outside at midnight. 
um more likely to have encounters as we've already mentioned when you're not looking for them um if you're kind of in between places uh and that can mean a lot of things like i've had a couple weird experiences when i'm standing in doorways which is probably just a commentary on how i should not hang out standing in doorways because weird <laughs> things happen I mean, we both know cat heave, and we know cats. <laughs> this thing about doors. I know. <laughs> it, it actually used to be an old um, Scottish folk practice. Uh, a way to um, tell the future was to stand in the doorway and hold the door jams and look out, and you're supposed to be able to see, kind of between worlds or past this world. So that's interesting. I should know better. I'll start doing my tarot readings in doorways <laughs> and see what changes. <laughs> Dude, do it as an experiment. Try uh, it a I'm couple down. times, see what happens. I don't know if you know me or not, but I like experiments. I, I do. I'm a hundred percent encouraging this behavior. <laughs> yes. <laughs> experiments are how you, you find the most interesting things. I agree. Um, I, it, since it came up, I really want to hammer that home, how important it is. Because so many people get locked into if it's not in a book or if it's not old or, you know, you know what I mean? Like if it's not already stamped approved, then you can't do it or you can't break the rule or the system somehow. And no, absolutely. Go out and experiment. Yeah. Try something. You know, there's not a single Icelandic or Nordic or Celtic source that says, go into your doorway and throw some tarot cards <laughs> and see if the reading feels different somehow. Right. Um but it's blending a few things that all make sense together. Yep. Yeah, that's how, and that's how soup is born. And I'm chubby and I like food. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm a big advocate for, you know, learning the folklore, learning the, the way things used to be done, the beliefs, how things are approached. But the reason that I'm, I'm such a big advocate of that is because you can't break the rules safely if you don't know what the rules are. That's true too. You know, if, if so. you kind of have a sense of like, okay, this is what's likely to happen. Then you can also kind of know like, this is how far I can push this. And if I push it too far and, you know, end up with a fairy dog in my lap, then these are the, my options for not getting eaten. Hopefully. Uh, I mean, do we know the fairy dog will eat us? <laughs> Well, we won't or find out. That propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to find out and report back. Right. Somebody. Right. Somebody not Christian, because I don't think it's fair that they get all the all the say in this matter. That's true. That's true. <laughs> no, I, I often encourage people to, you know, experiment. I just want people to do it safely. So yeah. when I'm telling people like don't don't jump into fairy rings, because there's so much folklore that says it's a bad idea. Um, you brought up fairy rings. I did. It's, I, I'm mostly saying it because most people who do that have no clue what they're doing. They don't know the folklore. They don't know the rules. They don't know really anything for how to interact with these beings. And that's like jumping into, you know, shark infested waters because you want to swim with sharks, but having absolutely no understanding of how to do that safely. Whereas once you know how to do it, you can do things like that and your, your yeah. odds of getting in and out are a lot better. Um, so once you get those basics down, yeah, go out, do the, the poorly thought out thing. ridiculous things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so glad you said fairy <laughs> rings because why not go after more social media stuff? Yeah. <laughs> it just took that turn. Um, I have a note here. Ask about fairy ring stuff online. My note refers to, I'm in a lot of different witchcraft groups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how you keep life interesting. <laughs> oh, oh, bless their wonderful hearts. <laughs> um, and you'll often see someone post pictures like, I found a fairy ring. Or, this is a fairy ring. What do I do? Or, how do I jump in the fairy ring? You know what I mean. Yeah. There's all these silly posts about fairy rings online. Are they a public danger or not? 90% <laughs> of the time, no. And yeah. here's the thing. The vast majority of the time, well, first of all, before I even get into that part, about half the time when people put up pictures of what they say is a fairy ring, it's not a fairy ring. 
So, I mean, I, I'm sorry for everyone who's, uh, you know, soul I'm crushing right now, but. All right. So let's quickly establish <laughs> what's a fairy ring before we decide that okay. they're creating public endangerment a f- <laughs> or not. A fairy ring is a circle of lighter <laughs> or darker grass, a circle of mushrooms, or in some very rare instances, and this is more Germanic folklore, a circle of flowers. But. When we say it's a circle, we actually mean it is like a clearly delineated, obvious circle. If it's like a U shape or like an oval shape or, you know, like you think maybe if you played connect the dots with it enough, it could look like a circle. That is not a fairy ring. You know, when when you see actual fairy rings, they're really obvious. So good, okay. good rule of thumb. If you're not sure, if you have All to right. ask yourself, could this be a fairy ring? It's not. Is the answer. Okay, we're at ground level. We've established the rules. <laughs> yes. Now let's break them. Yes. How are these people endangering the public or not? <laughs> so, yes. Um, 90% of the time when people jump in or out of actual fairy rings, you're not going to have an issue because the only time a fairy ring is dangerous is if it's active. And to explain what I mean by that to everyone I've now confused. Yeah. The point of a fairy ring, what a fairy ring is, is it's a place where the good folk, um, and again, this is um, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, um, French, German folklore. I mean, this is very widespread. This is not limited to any one particular culture. Pretty much like Western and Northern Europe uh, kind of share this. It's an, a place where these beings go to dance. And the idea is that when they are dancing, most humans, um, including most witches, I am sorry to tell you that, can't see them. And if you are in a place where they're actively dancing and you jump in, bad things will happen to you. Um, and again, it varies a little depending on the folklore um, in Brittany, which is parts of northern France, uh, your your odds are the best to get out of it reasonably safely. Um, in a lot of other places, though, because time works different between a human world and fairy, if you jump into a fairy ring and you start dancing with the good folk, your odds are pretty high that when you leave the next morning, it's actually going to be 10, 50, 100 years later, um, and your life is going to be significantly screwed up, clearly after that um there's also stories of people who will dance until they're exhausted um sometimes dance until they die uh you know once you get in you kind of can't get back out again sort of a thing Um, and some of that also depends on which fairies are dancing if it's some of the more malicious ones then you're probably going to be dancing till you die of exhaustion Um, (laughs) it's the more benevolent ones you might just pop out five years later you know Um, depending on how it goes. And there's even folklore that just sitting and watching fairies dance can have negative effects on people. So it's just that whole concept is kind of where the caution comes in. How do you know if they're dancing? Well, that... What are the clues? That is the tricky part. Um, Generally, if it's daytime, you're fine. Uh, I have not yet run across any significant folklore about... Um, fairies being out and dancing in the day it's, it's more of a nighttime fairy activity yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry so they're a lot like us yeah yeah um <laughs> you know save save the partying for nighttime that's right um you often can't tell again if you're the sort of human who can't see these beings which is most people um which is why the general warning is just don't do it don't step into these spaces. Don't jump into them because you don't know for sure if they're in use or not. Ninety um, percent of the time, they're not going to be. So, you know, that's why you hear all these stories of people. I jumped into a fairy ring and nothing happened. How do I get the good folk yeah. to take me away? Well, yeah. And then one day you run into this guy at the bar. He's like, "I stepped into a circle <laughs> of mushrooms, and that was ten fucking years ago, right? <laughs> according to you assholes." <laughs> Are you sure it's not? You know? <laughs> right. Are we sure it's not still 1990? Right. What happened? Okay. 
Um, so they're not really endangering people, but they not, don't understand what they're doing. Yeah, not so for the most either. part. And just to be completely clear, because yeah. this is something I see all the time <laughs> on social media, you cannot make your own fairy ring. You, you it's wah, it's wah, not wah, yeah, wah. <laughs> not a human thing. You you can't, um, you can't create it ritually. Um, I mean, aesthetically, I guess you you could, but it wouldn't be a fairy ring. It would just be a, a circular ring of whatever um hmm. that's that's just not a thing um so okay. all right so we've had just about none of my planned conversation <laughs> and i've loved every minute of it so what happens when you start off talking about <laughs> occult toilets <laughs> i know right and everyone is going to wonder what we were talking about um i have I'm going to have to skip some stuff. You're going to have to come back again. Okay. Uh, I have questions that came from Patreon members. Sure. Let's so, jump right in. Yeah. I mean, I owe them that much, right? So here's the part where you see my face, but I'm clearly reading. <laughs> um, Dara, our friend Dara from the Spirit Box podcast oh, asks, yeah. is there an association between a white mare and an Irish goddess as per Epona and Rihanna. Does that question make sense to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, a white mayor. Let me think. Cause the red, red mayor is associated with Anya, who is a goddess and a fairy queen um, around Lochgar and Nach Anya is, is her hill. Southwestern um, Ireland. Um, Maha, who is a goddess associated with Ulster um, also has some connection to horses. Um, I believe that's also a red, red mare though. Um, there is the, the larvon, uh, the white literally means white mare in Irish. Um, I don't think that's associated with a particular deity though. Um, trying to off the cuff think of any, the only thing I can think of, and I, I hate um, Gerald of Wales as a source for everything, always, ever, because he's <laughs> terrible. Um, but I, I believe he does talk about the, a white mayor representing the sovereignty of Ireland in a, a kingship ritual, which is completely not safe for work <laughs> to describe. So <laughs> I won't get into the details on that here, but. Um, gotcha. that would, you know, assuming we give Gerald of Wales any credit at all, uh, would connect a white mayor with sovereignty goddesses. Um, he just doesn't name specifically which ones. Um, but as far as I know that the closest Irish cognate to Pianan or Epona would be Maha. Um, okay. and I think when she's associated with horses, uh generally it's it's a red mayor um I'm trying to remember that comes from the dinhentius uh she's called the red mayor and the and the and the son of womanhood in the west if i remember correctly uh but not white but i will look more into that and see if i can <clears throat> dig up anything all right for dara next question comes from rebecca Rebecca is asking, what are some differences between the good folk and the elves? <laughs> uh, are yeah. there differences between the good folk and the elves? Would be an equally That's good question. That's a more legitimate question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mostly joke, uh, sort of. So here's where this gets a little complicated. So we're talking about the good folk. I assume, I'm assuming we're more talking about the Irish um, good folk I gentry. Agree. Yeah. Elves, however, um, elf is one of those words, kind of like fairy, that applies to so many different beings. Mm -hmm. And I would assume, again, here, primarily she's um, intending the Icelandic, the Alfar. Um, and comparing the Icelandic Alfar to the Irish, the Nishi, the, the good folk, uh, is certainly really interesting. I will quickly, before we get into that, note that in Scotland, what we would call the, the good folk, the gentry, the, the Irish, uh, the Inishi, are, are called elves. Hence my little joke at the beginning about 
<clears throat> you, you know, are we even talking about the same thing? Because we might be. <laughs> Um, because Scotland had much more of a Norse influence, they refer to what we would call fairies in Ireland as elves in Scotland, which is not at all confusing. However, when we're <laughs> specifically looking at the Irish and the Icelandic, they're very, very similar. And it is important to understand as we get into that, that Iceland has a lot of Irish influence on it. Um, Iceland clearly was settled by the Norse. However, a lot of the women involved in that were Irish, um, involuntary, <laughs> I will clarify, yeah. but um, yeah. yeah. And you also had some Irish religious settlements, as I understand it, in Iceland before the, the Norse came to settle. So there is a surprising amount of crossover, and there have been some um, academics who've kind of taken a look at this and it's likely that this, the close similarity between the Icelandic Alfar and the Irish Athenishi is because of this cultural crossover, which goes back about a thousand years. Um, they're physically described very similarly. They tend to do a lot of the same things. Um, they both have a penchant for dairy products and for <laughs> um, stealing human beings uh, the biggest difference that comes to my mind is that the Icelandic Alfar are a lot nicer um, comparatively. In modern Iceland, I will say that the Alfar are often minimized now. They're often seen as being much smaller than they were in the older folklore and stories. They were very, um, you know, five to six foot tall beings in the older material. Um, modern Iceland is an interesting array of options there. Um, but whereas the, the Irish thing is you really don't grade on a curve and are very quick to anger and very quick to respond harshly, we'll say. Um, the Icelandic Alfar seem to be a lot more lenient with that sort of thing. Um, not completely safe to deal with. None of these beings would be, but um, your odds are much higher if you are really rude or screw up with the Alfar in Iceland as opposed to in Ireland. Um, and I will say if we then take it to Germany and look at the, the Elven, the elves in um, German folklore, we're going to see again, a lot of these similarities, but the, the German elves would probably be a little bit more distinctly different compared to the Icelandic or the Irish. Um, there's there's clearly like less of a cultural crossover if that makes sense to people um, I would mm -hmm. I would personally suspect that what we find in German folklore is what the Icelandic beliefs were before the Irish intermixing um, so we don't see the as much of that influence emphasis on dairy for example um, in the German with the German elves uh, and they can do things like they can travel through knot holes in walls and wood to get in and out of residences and and stuff like that. They're connected to butterflies and moths is a form they'll take. And you don't see that in the other places. So, hmm. sorry, I'm really nerding out on these cross-cultural right. elves. <laughs> I know they like it. <laughs> I can Next question. Going. Yeah. I know you can. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question comes from Amy. Amy asks, should I be worried if I think the good folk are becoming more active in my house? <laughs> Ain't that some shit. <laughs> I feel like that's a trick question. Um, Isn't it? <laughs> it depends a lot on how we mean more active. Um, generally speaking, inside a home, um, Inside a home, you have a, a different relationship with these beings, um, whatever you'd want to call them. House spirits uh, is one of the more common terms. Um, house fairies, uh, what have you. Um, usually the, the sorts of ones that are going to live inside a home that's occupied um, are the kind that, that want to be around humans anyway. Um they're the sorts in the older folklore that we would we would always kind of see associated with houses and farmyards and that kind of thing. 
Um, so they're rarely outright malicious and they usually um, prefer to be on good terms with the humans. They're not looking for trouble. I'll put it that way. Yeah. They're not looking for trouble. <laughs> so as long as you're like, you know, basically polite to them and, you know, don't talk smack. Uh, it's usually a thing that will really offend house spirits is if you tar- start like talking bad about them. Um, maybe occasionally leave something out for them. And in heathenry, the practice would be on a, um, a lot of people do it on the solstice. Traditionally, it would be Christmas Eve, but um, somewhere in that range around the winter solstice, uh, leave out a thing of porridge with a um, big pat of butter on the top for your uh, Nisa or house spirit. Um, that would be considered like the, the one time a year you kind of have to give them an offering to keep them happy. But otherwise, they're pretty chill to be around. Um, if you're in a situation, because I know this happens to people where like your car keys are constantly getting stolen or misplaced <laughs> or wandering around, um, usually that's actually kind of a, a sign of friendliness. <laughs> that's, their way, <laughs> that's their way of saying they like you. Um, and the, the best thing to do if it's a problem is to just ask them to give the stuff back. Uh you know, just let them know, I, I appreciate it, but I, I need to know where my keys are, kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, offer up another option for hide and seek. Yeah, yeah. If if yeah. you're in a rare situation where you're having more dangerous thing going on, like maybe you have one of the, the Mara uh, nightmares, uh, would be the modern term. I don't, I try not to use the modern term because then people get confused and think I mean like dream nightmares. Um, nightmare mm-hmm. uh, Mara is an, an older spirit that causes night terrors and um, sleep paralysis and things of that nature. Um, if, if something like that's going on, then there are specific ways to protect against it. But I'm assuming from the question, it's probably more just a, you know, you're feeling them more around you inside the house. Yeah. And, and no, cool. I, I mean, I can't speak for Amy's intention on this. I just know Amy well enough that uh, she is new to witchcraft she's coming into her figuring out exactly what form that's going to take and um that was a really good question for somebody who's entering into that realm of thought that's really it is a good question and you know it is important to keep in mind that the sorts of things you're going to have inside your house are different from the sorts of things you're going to meet in the woods or you know generally outside and you do want to be careful never to like open your front door and put out a blanket invitation because you don't want the things that would normally be chilling in the woods coming into your house, because then you will have problems. But yeah. you know, <laughs> that's when you don't want to be that three-legged dog in your kitchen. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. That's a whole different scenario, yeah. especially at night. <laughs> well, and and most of the good folk are very into semantics and contracts, so. If you put out a blanket invitation, it's actually enormously difficult to revoke that and get them out again. So, yeah. you know, just be careful with your words, everyone. Yeah. Yesterday I was having lunch with uh, the senior druid and a very dear friend of mine of our ADF Grove in Champaign-Urbana. Cool. And her name is Ashley. And Ashley, when I asked her if she had anything she'd like to ask you, said she'd like to hear something more about death in an Irish context. <laughs> and she was kind of referring to like we hear, on, we, we know an awful lot of what the, the Nordic people thought about death. We, I don't, I'm not sure because I'm not familiar. Is there not much surviving about what the Irish thought? That's such a broad question. Um, like death in a literal sense the, or the afterlife? Or... The a- I, let's go afterlife. I think that's what she was is gearing at and if not she'll just have to suffer (laughs) (laughs) okay um because i mean death in a literal physical sense there's quite a bit of material about that like how bodies would have to be treated and things you'd have to do in the house and, and that sort of thing um superstitions we would call them the afterlife it is a little complicated we don't have a lot the way we do with heathenry from the Irish um, pre-Christian period. Uh, What we mostly have is what survived in folklore. 
which gives us a sense of um even though it's it's coming through kind of a christian lens a lot of it is not clearly christian material um so we have this idea that you know some people will continue on as spirits ghosts some people do end up with the good folk um and again much like the fairy circles this is not a thing that humans can do intentionally um you can't decide that you're going to go to the other world when you die um it seems to be a thing that they they pick who they are going to take or not um we don't know a lot about um like what we have in heathenry the idea that there's certain halls of certain gods and that um some of the dead go to different halls much more complicated by the way than the simple some people go to helheim some people go to valhalla as i'm sure right. you of course know lonnie but for everyone else this thing uh, multiple yeah. multiple multiple <laughs> options going on with that um we we don't have anything in the irish material that would indicate for example that like some people go to the morrigan some people go to anya some people go to lou you know that sort of thing um what we do have which is just kind of a fractional hint um in a couple sources is this idea that the first human who died um sort of the primal ancestor his name is don um he has a home it's called tectun um, the house of don it's actually a physical place um i have seen it it's very cool it's a big rock out in the ocean um and it is said that everyone who dies no matter what where they're going from there everyone who dies has to go to don's house um that you go there first it's think of it like grand central station for dead humans um and that you have to pass through there before you go on anywhere else um because hmm. he is sort of that primal ancestor a lot of people think that he's probably the irish version of like a god of the dead for that reason um that's interesting yeah uh <clears throat> and a quick funny story quick funny story about how he ended up as the first human to die um he basically he and his brothers were the humans who were invading ireland which at the time was under the control of the irish gods tuatha and the sovereignty goddesses of the Tuatadanan approached the the brothers um and basically said you know make a deal with us and we will allow you to win because obviously sovereignty goddesses you know is sort of up to them ultimately and the other two brothers were kind of like okay you know this this is probably the best way to go but don was like you know what we have our own gods and we don't need to make this <laughs> deal and this is not what i'm going to do and then they all went back to their ships and then don was also kind of like and i'm just going to murder everything that lives here i'm going to put it all to the sword everything and then a big wave <laughs> came up <laughs> and swamped his ship and he drowned because you don't back sass the gods <laughs> poor planning on his part and that is how he became the first human to die in ireland <laughs> and the primal ancestor and i don't know why i think that story is so funny but it always cracks me up like his his brothers did uh, not well. get back sassy and they won <laughs> <laughs> so there's something to be said for talking shit yeah yeah i mean i guess he did don't, get to be the god of the dead it. but you know. yeah i mean but is that a job you want <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i mean he didn't he didn't exactly volunteer so yeah no, he wasn't dressed for the job he wanted. <laughs> so he got the one he needed. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like hell right. in, in the Norse, you know, who just, Odin was just like, you, um, go be the goddess of the dead. You're going to do this now. Yeah. Yeah. Except. Yeah, that's, that's not a job I would want. That's all I'm saying. No. no. Well, whether he wants it or not, he, he his mouth wrote a check, his butt couldn't cash. And, <laughs> there you go. And that's where he ended up. So, Dara has one more question, and that's the end of those. Dara asks, also, can we consider the Irish gods and goddesses avatars of and expressions of the great mother goddess like 
Anu or Danu. Did I say those right? Um, I think that's going to depend a lot on your individual understanding yeah. of the gods. And I, I do hesitate to tell other people how to perceive deity um, because everyone is very individual, like how you, you personally understand them. If you take a more henotheistic view or duotheistic view um, or monotheistic view and you view um, all named gods as aspects um, or avatars, however you want to phrase it, of one ultimate power, um, then I, I suppose uh, I, that's not my personal viewpoint. Um, yeah. So there's nothing in the history or anything that would suggest that that would be how it was viewed. No. Um, what we I didn't think so. Yeah. What we have in the mythology is is pretty clear that they were always viewed as um, unique individuals. Um, mm -hmm. They they die. They don't actually die, and then they're back in the story. Um, you know, death is a temporary <laughs> yeah. thing for them. But beyond that. Um, there were some later discussion that Hukulun might actually be Lu in a form, but that was really into the Christian period. So I'm a little skeptical myself um, of that interpretation. Uh, generally with the Irish gods, it's that's just not how they tended to be um, described or understood. And the whole Danu slash Anu thing is is a bit of a stickety wicket anyway, because um, there's a like a 75 to 80% chance she didn't actually exist in the pagan period, um, that she was a later uh, literary creation or a creation of the um, scholars. Because, fun fact, originally the two of Dana were just called the two of day, um, people of the gods. But when the stories were written down, we have some sources that call them that. That also became the term that was used for, I believe it was the Israelites in the Bible. Um, because Old Irish is the way it is, to a day also can be read as people of God. Um, mm. People of God or the gods. Um, either reading would be accurate. And this kind of caused the scribes a problem because it started to get confusing and unclear. Um, and obviously you didn't want to imply the old Irish gods were wandering around, you know, the deserts of Egypt, but also didn't want people thinking that, you know, the, the Israelites were kicking around Ireland and named the Dagda and the Morrigan. So they started adding um, Danan to Tua Dei, so Tua De Danan. We don't actually know for sure what Tua De Danan means. Um, the, the kind of commonly accepted reading of it is people of the goddess Danu, but that's speculation. Um, the name Danu never appears as that name anywhere in any Irish mythology. Um, it's thought to be uh, well, I shouldn't say thought to be. The the form Danu is a reconstructed form in modern ages uh, based on the grammatical form that we find it in, which is the possessive. I'm sorry, I'm boring everyone right now with this, but um, Danan is the possessive form because Old Irish conjugates anything that'll hold still, uh, including names. <laughs> <laughs> so um the problem comes in that you could also read Tua de Danan as people of the gods of skill, um, because that is another meaning of, of Dana. So mm, that whole thing gets really messy and muddy. Um, if she did exist as a deity, um, which is possible, it's just sort of less likely. But if she did, she was really an obscure deity. Um, she was definitely not the mother of the whole pantheon. Um, and how it became to a Danan, if they, the scribes actually were implying um, Danu as a goddess, uh, would seem to be fairly arbitrary that they picked her um, as opposed to any of the others. Uh, we certainly don't have any preserved mythology about her. So, um, Okay. 
if that answers the question. I hope it answers the question. <laughs> I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't um, know that, to be fair. Yeah. I have so many other things I want to ask you about. <laughs> You're going to come back for another episode soon. Sure. It's a deal. <laughs> so we're getting to the end of the regular portion. So we don't get so long. People stop listening. Um, is there anything you wanted to talk about or I didn't cover that you'd like to throw in now? Oh, we covered so many fun things. Um, I know, right? Yeah. I, I can't think of anything. Um, All right, I, I do have a book coming out next April. Pantheon's yes, the do. Norse. I'm very excited it's about so that. so fucking good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is. I, I am a, you can directly quote me on this. I said, I'm so glad for just the price of around 15 bucks. I can now, once it's out, recommend to someone a book that will help them if they're interested in heathenry at all. Hit the ground running. Like it is, and from an, an amazing, inclusive author, you clearly know your stuff. Like, I cannot recommend getting that book enough. And you can't even pre order the thing yet. Not yet. <laughs> but you did get an advanced reader copy. So I did. did. Nan and Nana boo boo. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you for saying that. I, you know, there's, yeah, there are, so good. There are some good <laughs> beginner books out there. Um, some of them are written by friends of mine. So, you know, no, right. no shade there, but you know, I wanted to write something that was as neutral, um, philosophically as possible. I'm trying to, th- I'm trying to say this as carefully as I can, um, that really wasn't advocating a particular approach that wasn't, um, mm-hmm. you know, about the only thing in that book that I'm very strong about is that, you know, white supremacy is awful and terrible and has no place in heathenry. Right. And outside of that, you know, it's it's meant to be something that anyone, whatever your personal approach to heathenry is, could get use out of. So yeah, I just it, it it's another addition in what heathenry needed so badly is uh, books that don't require an asterisk. <laughs> you know, uh, like I don't have to explain anything about the author or problematic problems you may encounter in the book or something when yours comes out when other there are a few others that are already out there that are like that and heathenry just needs more of that yeah. and it's it's good to see that something so well done is going to be added to that stack Thank so I, it's going to the front of the line of the things i recommend from oh now on, i take that as available. high praise yeah i, I completely destroyed my copy of uh simic's uh dictionary of northern mythology <laughs> Right, because it's so much yeah. like flipping to get references. Uh, it completely broke uh-huh. the binding. Pages fell out. It's very dramatic. Yeah. It's a very vital book. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, cool. Yeah, please go get that. Any upcoming courses or anything you got going on? Um, I have to try to remember now. I'm teaching at an ADF event in September. Um, not sure how open to the public that one is actually, because it's through ADF, but I'll. I'll share it and advertise it when we get closer. Um, I'm a little burnt out. June was a, a very hectic month for me. I did three events, three weekends in a row because I have no sense of proportion. So yeah. I'm kind of taking July off from all of that. Uh, so now I clearly can't remember what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> yeah. Except the show. I remember the show. So thank goodness. <laughs> All right. So where can people find you and all of your amazing work? Everywhere. I mean, we've established I'm on TikTok, so clearly I'm everywhere. Um, Somewhere on TikTok. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I am on Instagram. Uh, Don't follow me on Instagram unless you like boring nature pictures, because that's literally all I post on there. Um, I, you can get my books on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, and everything's all under my name, Morgan Daimler. Uh, I made it kind of easy and streamlined. So straightforward. Uh, except on that Tumblr. Works. If you want to find me on Tumblr, you, you're going to have to really look because that's, that's <laughs> my secret Tumblr identity. Oh, man. Yeah. That, you've had that for years, haven't you? I have. I have. I've been <laughs> instigating fake propaganda yeah. on Tumblr for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on Tumblr. I'm pretty sure it 
on Tumblr as Chaos Heathen. Nice. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'll have to so, track you down. Track me down, and then I'll know your secret identity. <laughs> you and will. That's how that works, folks. <laughs> it's not subtle. <laughs> it's not that subtle. So. All right. Tumblr's where people get real weird, so I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mostly sort of like ghost in and then make some like pithy comment about um fairies and why they're probably gonna end up eating you if you're not careful and then i like ghost back out again so i don't post much on tumblr i'm not there very often i go to tumblr once a month sometimes twice specifically because of a blog called cold albion yeah and the writer of that blog i know it i know him a I don't know that he wants his name out there, so I'm keeping it to myself. Fair. Um, is I call him the Raven God's prophet, and I mean it every fucking time I say it. Okay. If he is not a legit voice for Odin in this world, then I don't know anything. And he doesn't like it when I say it, and I don't care. Interesting. <laughs> well, now I'm intrigued. Because it's true. Yeah. It, he's just got a gift, and he sees his the myth and the world through a mind that is unbelievably brilliant i cannot shower that man with enough praise and adoration he deserves it he doesn't get it and it's not fair nice so yeah there's that if you're into heathenry and really mystically looking into it you want to follow the cold aldian blog i promise you that well first i have to find okay. you i have to find you and follow you yeah. first that's not hard. <laughs> so, while she's finding me on Tumblr, thank you sure. so much, Morgan, for coming back. It's been awesome to have you again. Thank you for having me. It's always always fun to talk with you. Great. Um, for everyone listening, we are going to extend this discussion off into the Patreon portion of the show. If you want to hear just how extra weird this shit gets, you're going to have to go to weirdwebradio.com, click join the membership, or go to patreon.com and look for weird web radio which is patreon.com slash weird web radio got it good all right stay weird out there my friends it's been great talking to you again it's... and now bonus audio time <laughs> now for the extra fun <laughs> the extra fun all right normally this conversation starts with what famous person's resting place would you most like to visit you've already been here you already answered that question I forgot to look it up and see what it was. You know, and I can't remember when I was on last. And I don't want you to tell me because it's going to make me feel old. But I actually, yeah. my my goal, my bucket list goal was to get to see. Um... Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife what they may or may not do in cemeteries what are their traditions and magical practices that have to do with the dead folklore that surrounds their homes and so much more available for only five dollars five dollars a month even if i make more than one episode in a month it's still just five dollars a month at patreon.com slash weird web radio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weird web radio you can find me on facebook as weird web radio or come join the new fun and exciting weird web radio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends mm-hmm.